Ben Fisichero. I go to Penn State University. And together we were studying great areas this summer on the set. Our project was serving and best monitoring of the great So, uh, why are we studying the Great Vireo? Um, at the start of the summer, when we went to do a literature, research, uh, literature search, it really didn't take very long, because there's a very small body of evidence on the Great Vireo. Um, most of the papers out there have just dealt with their, what they're doing in the breeding range and overall their success. Um, but we do know there is a reason to be concerned, because they're federally listed as a bird conservation concern, and they're listed in New Mexico as being endangered. So um, we wanted to study this bird, and when our mentor uh, a couple years ago noticed that there was a pretty successful population on the refuge, it only made sense to assign some or some RU students to look into that. The only long-term data set we have comes from the Breeding Bird Survey, which is done every spring and uh, as a series of long 25-mile transects with point counts, and that showed a very loose, not really significant upward trend. Um, that probably has more to do with the change in the sample than, uh, than any actual So this is the habitat of the Great Vireo. As you can see, there are a lot of pinyon and junipers, mostly jun uh, juniper trees in this area, but it's also a lot of grassland in between. We have this uh, habitat on both sides of the refuge, and it's great for the Vireos because that they nest in juniper. This map, we're right in their summer breeding range, so the set is great habitat. So, a couple of threats that the Great Vireo faces. A big one is the brown-headed cowbird. This is a bird native to the Great Plains region of the United States that evolved to follow around buffalo birds. And um, the way they evolved, they never had time to stop and raise a nest and get their young settled down. So they would just lay their egg in another bird's nest that bird would recognize it as its own and then um, raise it. Uh, and that's called being a nest parasite. So obviously that's disruptive to the host species. Um, and as we found out, the great vireo is often a victim of this. They're also quite vulnerable to predation from variety of species, of snakes, uh, pinion jays, north, or loggerhead shrikes, and northern mockingbirds, all of which we saw in abundance at our sample sites. And like pretty much every bird in North America, they face the similar challenges of destruction and alteration to their habitat. A big one in this region is cattle grazing, and uh, it's especially a challenge because they're unique to the pinion juniper savanna, and how uh, cattle or other topics really alter that habitat into something that it's not. So with all this in mind, we came up with three main research questions. Um, and we would listen. 
And uh, if at any point, even if we weren't doing a formal survey, if we heard the bird singing, we would drop what we were doing and immediately track it down. Uh, they're very territorial and they really love to sing. They make a lot of noise and they'll go around and kind of outline where their territory is. And if you keep watching, you'll notice patterns of where they keep going back to. And that's most likely their nest tree or a budget in some cases. So once we find the bird, we watch it for a while until we can find its nest. And once we found the nest, we would monitor that nest by returning every three to five days and checking how many eggs were in it and um, how many hatched, how many fledglings, etc. So this is a juniper tree. Um, this is, we found all of our nests in juniper tree. But does anybody see the gray vireo nest? <laughs> um, this is actually a bit of dead foliage. I can barely see it. It's right here. I don't even remember how we found this one. It takes a while to pass. It points over two hours. Um, this one was a little easier to see, especially since there's a nice little vireo sticking its butt at us. Uh, it was actually building its nest at the time. Um, this was in Boot Lake Canyon. Uh, this is often what we find when we go to check the nest. The bird would be sitting in there, they'd really hunger into the nest, and they don't like to leave. Um, we would try to see what, what was inside the nest, but they would snap at us with their bills, and we would lose data points because the birds simply wouldn't fly away from the nest. This is a happy little vireo nest. It's got three gray vireo eggs. You can see that they're white with a little bit of brown speckling. What about this nest? Anybody have any ideas? <laughs> exactly. This one's bigger, it's darker, it's more speckled. Um, that's because it's a cowbird. And uh, this nest was later abandoned by the parents because they were able to recognize that something was awry. So, I like this picture because it's so cute. Uh, we have three adorable gray vireo hatchlings. They're just under a week old. Um, this was in Blue Lake Canyon, and all of these birds are out there flying around us. This is, I think, the same nest. Uh, a little while later, this is when there was just one bird left. It has all its feathers. It's probably going to leave um, in a matter of days. And this is a fledgling that just left its nest. You can see it doesn't even have a tail. It's still growing some feathers. It still looks kind of scrubby. Um, and it's still totally dependent on its parents for food. It couldn't even fly away. I was literally like, right next to it before we even noticed that it was there. And this unfortunately is a, a cowbird fledgling we found um, a similar age, still doesn't have a tail, and he was making a lot of noise and crying to his parents to feed him, his uh, adopted parents as you can say. Uh, yeah. So after we found most of our nests, we started our vegetation survey. What we did was we surveyed all our nest trees and also trees at 33 uh, randomly chosen points to compare the vegetation between those areas. And we did this so that we could figure out what preferred habitat here is like for their nests. So these are our methods. On the far right, you see Ben holding our nest mirror. We used it to measure the height of the tree. And then we also measured the canopy of the tree, which means how wide it is. And with that pink checkered board, I would hold it up on one side of the tree, and Ben would look through the tree on the other side. And what that did was it's an estimate because early on we noticed that several uh, nest trees seem to be kind of sparse, like they're almost, the foliage is kind of see-through, and there are a lot of dead branches, so we figured we would measure how sparse the tree is to see if nest trees were more sparse than just random trees. We would look at ground cover, we take a plot, set it on the ground, and just look at what uh, grasses or forbs are growing in. So this is the results from the survey we did. Uh, so just so you know, GRVI means Grand Bureau, VHCO means Brown Headed Calvert, these are band code abbreviations. And the percent in uh, these two columns represents the percent of the survey points at which we recorded observations of either of those species. Most of the observations were vocal. Um, we didn't see them quite as much. General trend, uh, Sepultura Flats had by far the most of 
both species. Um, it was a more friendly habitat, open grassland. Whereas the two canyons had um, fewer birds overall. Uh, Pinos Canyon especially, although that uh, number, that average, is sort of thrown off by the fact that a large section of the sample region wrapped around the outside of White Face Mountain facing the flats, and that more exposed habitat, the Vireos didn't like it, we didn't find a single Vireo or Cowbird there. But overall, we found 19 total nests, and only 35% uh, 30, of those nests successfully. So, this is a map of Pinos Canyon on the top, and the lake at the bottom, and as you can see, all the nests we found were pretty deep the red dot and the kind of whitish outline is our sample site. And in Pino's, uh, Pino's Canyon, all but one nest was successful. And in Boot Lake, one nest out of the two was successful. And here you see we have a lot more nests in Sepultura and they're all pretty much spaced out. But only three nests were successful. And well, only three nests fledged young, and one of those nests didn't even fledge gray vireos, they fledged cowbirds. So basically, Sepultura had more nests, but fewer of them had gray vireos. So here's some preliminary vegetation data. We apologize in advance because we finished collecting this on Wednesday. Still working on it, um, working on the case. But, uh, one trend we noticed right off the bat was that our nest trees averaged larger than the randomly selected trees. Um, we have yet to crunch the statistics on it. But it seems like it might support our hypothesis about um, nest trees having less foliage or, or more dead branches. Next, here are our ground cover results. And ground cover is when we took the plot and laid it on the ground to see what kind of vegetation there was. In four cardinal directions, 10 meters from the tree. So if you take each row, they should add up to about 400. For because uh, each quad had 100 squares. So as you can see, for all our sites, it was around 350-ish squares out of 400 were bare ground. And next, it was around 30 to 40 squares for grass, and then the rest were pretty low. And if you divide everything by 400, you get the percentages. But what you see is that for all our sites, 90% of all the quads were bare ground and 10% of all the quads were in the grass. And this isn't only true for our sites, it's also true for all the nest and control surveys, which means there's, for now, there's no difference between nest trees and randomly selected trees for the ground. So, uh, a couple of things we want to bring up. Uh, Vireos, in general, just have low nest success, and that is consistent with the literature we've read, um, where they reported successes as low as 20%, but no higher than 65 or 70. And the vast majority of this, of this is due to predation and parasitism, uh, both from you know, jays as well as you know, a lot of ground and cowbird. Uh, but when the nests aren't interfered with by other species, the vireos really have no problem with fledging all of their young. And in most of the nests where we saw fledglings, they had three or four young um, that are hopefully still out there. So next we noticed that at least in our canyons, all the nests were pretty deep into the canyon. There are no nests on the outsides of the canyon that face the grass. Um, so that might be because there might be less grounded cowbirds Yes, uh, nest searching is very labor intensive, and I hate to, to brag, but uh, compared to previous RUs, they found uh, seven nests and three nests. So as far as I'm concerned, I know it's not a competition, but uh, one. <laughs> oh, and we do have more data to go through, as we mentioned. We haven't even touched the shrub uh, survey analysis. So we have some future improvements to this now next year's RUs. Change the survey regions. So, for example, include more canyons since that's 
as far as canyons are concerned, they're deeper than canyons. Um, less of the outsides of mountains that face the open grasses, because we didn't find any birds there this summer. And also more of seven bird flats, because at that site we found at least one nest that was outside of our sample region. And also, we're pretty sure we heard several vireos, probably two or three, that are also outside the sample region. So if we uh, expand that survey site, we could include more vireos. And it's possible, well, we know for a fact that there are great vireos on the west side because of literature that was written on the mountain range on the west side. But the west side is pretty hard to get to, so if you want hard work for next year's RUs, then you could include the west side as some of their survey. Um, we also recommend continuing the vegetation data. This was the first year that it was added as a component of the project. Uh, a couple of things you should be looking into are the overall height of the vegetation, both measuring the, the grasses, how tall they grow, as well as like, the amount of shrubs in a general more like, spatial sense, because uh, that could sort of influence how and where it appears like the perch and where they can sink from. Going along with that, uh, our method of measuring sparseness was shaking because oftentimes when we look at a tree, it's, you know, it would look sparse. We'd see big dead branches, but uh, it wouldn't reflect that in the estimate we took with the cover board. So um, probably doing more research and finding a, a more standardized way to measure foliage density or just counting number of dead branches. Also, uh, we, we, the survey did include you know, recording cowbird observations, but we think that should be expanded to pretty much any time uh, we're in the field. Uh, we should be recording how many cowbirds there are to see if there really are more in Sepulchre Flats versus the canyons, causing that difference in, in uh, the parasitism and predation rates. Finally, we have several people that, well, a lot of people Thank <laughs> you. 